morning, everyone, and uh, thank you all for coming uh, on a winter morning. It's uh, very difficult to get everyone out of the slumber, in a sense, but uh, uh, those who have made it here uh, clearly shows uh, uh, interest on the subject and, of course, on the author. The author is fairly popular in the Indian circle, um, and uh, Asanga has been coming to India for a very long time. In fact, the, uh, one of the first times when we hosted him at ORF was when he was the director at the uh, Kadigama Center. And since then, he has moved on to heading another, uh, the Ministry of Defense funded think tank, uh, the Institute for National Security Studies, Sri Lanka. Um, so he's very well plugged into the establishment, but at the same time, uh, uh, framing, the, pre framing and influencing the policy making within the country in a very effective manner. Um, so I think it gives us great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Asanga out here today morning, Asanga Abhay Gunashrikara, uh, who's the Director General of the uh, you know, INSSL. Um, Sri Lanka has remained uh, important to India for several different reasons. Uh, it's one of the most important neighbors. So from a neighborhood policy itself, Sri Lanka has occupied a central stage in India's policy. Uh, we have had our difficulties along the way. But I think over the last two decades, uh, the relationship has stabilized uh, to a large extent. And as a big neighbor, India has to remain sensitive to smaller neighbors, smaller, uh, smaller neighbors and their concerns. Um, Sri Lanka is also an important Indian Ocean country. Uh, the maritime dimension in the Asian politics has begun to uh, cast a shadow uh, in, big, uh, in, in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, given the geographical location of Sri Lanka, uh, it is witnessing certain amount of power play uh, in the region, and Colombo is so far managing it pretty well. But I think we, um, I think the major power politics is, is making it a little difficult for them to uh, make those strategic choices. Um, Sri Lanka is maybe a small nation, but a powerful one. And like I said, as a big neighbor, we need to remain alive to Colombo's concerns as well. One of the problems on the Indian side when it comes to Sri Lanka policy has been how India has many times let the Tamil Nadu fact, the Tamil factor, uh, let it play in the bilateral relationship. I think that's one area where India has to remain uh, more uh, pertinent as to how this will play out, how, has to remain conscious of how this will play out in the bilateral relations. And therefore, the central, the national level policy on Sri Lanka should not be dictated, allowed to be dictated by the Tamil factor um, to beyond a certain point, beyond a certain uh, limit. Um, India uh, has its own worries about Sri Lanka from time to time. And one of the areas is the big geopolitical factor. Uh, the China factor in Sri Lanka is something that has raised concerns in New Delhi time and again. Uh, the growing uh, clout and influence of China and Sri Lanka, as well as in the larger neighborhood, Indian neighborhood, is something that has raised the antenna several times in the Indian uh, in the Indian uh, security context. Um, but again, I can I think uh, we need to be sensitive to each other's concerns in building and sustaining a peaceful and stable Indian Ocean neighborhood, for which both India and Sri Lanka have a clear responsibility. To talk about all of this, I think uh, uh, Dr. Asanga has done a terrific book, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Uh, the title of the book is uh, Sri Lanka at Cross Crossroads, Geopolitical Challenges and National Interests. I think this is precisely what we discussed, is going to be uh, discussed by the author at great length um, uh, in the next uh, few minutes. Um, to moderate the session, to chair through the session today, I have a very able um, a person, uh, Ambassador G. Parthasarthi, again, somebody who doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, he's a, he has had a led successful diplomatic career. He's currently the director of the India Sri Lanka Foundation, so somebody very able to um, chair the discussions this morning. He's also the chancellor of the Central University of Jammu and president of the India Habitat Center. Uh, I will now uh, hand it over to Ambassador G. Parthasarthi to take, uh, to, to take over and then we'll have a discussion from the night uh, till about 12 o'clock. Okay. Thank you all for coming, and over to you, Thank sir. Thank you, I think I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, Rajeshwari. Yale, uh, that's a pretty enviable thing to achieve. Uh, welcome to the ORF. Um, may I have really, Rajeshwari has said what needs to be said, but uh, let's bear in mind that uh, we are going into elections next year, 
and 2020 is both your presidential and uh, parliamentary elections. So uh, elections have their own dimensions. But I think uh, something which I, I would like to mention that uh, we need to show sensitivity. And, uh, you know, when uh, submarines suddenly start appearing in ports in Sri Lanka, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, 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 does, it does raise issues in India. Um, we, uh, and I would like to make one point, and Rajiv Bhatia, who's here, who's really dealt with this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for <laughs> several years, I think it's it's not that India wants to tell you what your relations with a third country should be. And far be it. And uh, in fact, you will find India uh, working in Sri Lanka now together with many countries ranging from Japan to the West, where we share common interests. Uh, but um, we do hope uh, that, as I said, these security concerns need to be taken into account. One basic factor which uh, I've been working on, and I hope Sri Lanka will bear it in mind. You know, the message of Lord Buddha went from Sri Lanka to Southeast Asia, uh, not from India to Southeast Asia, uh, touching the shores of Tamil Nadu. And uh, I think we should look at combined Buddhist tourism circuits and enhanced people-to-people -people contacts on that basis. Uh, and Finally, on the Tamils, I think really, if you see, our priorities have changed. The Jaffna Tamil is, is well off, he's got an expatriate community. Really, the people whom we are concentrating now, at least at least on the India Sri Lanka Foundation, is the Indian Tamils, who have a long way to go. So I leave it at that and welcome once again. Uh, I hope to read your book, and uh, I'm sure coming from a friend and well-wisher in Sri Lanka, it's always welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you so much, um, um, Rajeshwari and uh, Mr. Parthasati and uh, distinguished uh, scholars here. So um, it is a great honor to be here at the ORF. Um, I was first, uh, my first visit to ORF was some time back, and uh, it was Ambassador uh, Rasagotra uh, who actually took his time to bring here and uh, bring me here and introduce to some of the brilliant researchers here. So I, we follow your work very carefully and uh, your pieces have been very, very interesting and also the um, on research. So I congratulate you um, as one of the leading think tanks in Delhi. So excellent work. Um, well, let me um, sort of, um, it's, it's great to... Um, do the book talk, first talk uh, in India, and uh, because the Colombo talk is going to be tomorrow. Books are printed in India, although the publisher is in Singapore. And uh, so I, <laughs> yeah, so my publisher is saying, hold on, the, the, it is printed here, so you can do the talk. And um, thank you for such a short time, and Raji managed to bring this audience, and uh, great, honor, great honor to speak and also to talk to you. Um, I think um, on book book uh, book launches and all that. I have uh, last book launch I've been was the former president's uh, book launch, Rajapaksa, and uh, was a very popular character uh, politician. And um, the issue was the the speaker was so good. Uh, it was uh, the former foreign minister, Professor G. L. Piris, and he has a almost a photographic memory. And um, when he spoke of the entire book, the person on the left and the right said, uh, I'm not, we're not going to buy this book. Because then I asked him why, because the speaker said everything, uh, what is in the book. So why would I buy the book? So <laughs> I, what I'm going to do is give you a few points of the uh, areas that I've highlighted and why uh, I chose this topic and what was the reason behind it. And um, the book is first dedicated to my children, uh, Avish and Arya, so it's eight and uh, nine, uh, nine years. And um, I begin with a, quote, uh, a poem uh, referring to uh, the ancient uh, Sri Lankan uh, uh, poet, one of the greatest we had. Uh, his name is Mahagama Sekara. And he says, uh, a child is born and um, he's, he's not smiling because of the debt uh, that the nation is having and the fear of tomorrow. Um, I think it was very relevant um, to bring this to my book because uh, Sri Lanka is seen 
as a country that is in debt trap. Uh, you see, uh, there's predatory loans. Um, I hear this everywhere. During my travels, I travel extensively. Um, the last 10 years in think tanks, work first in the foreign policy think tank and now in the security uh, think tank. So from Hudson Institute to various other places to Davos to, uh, it's all a compilation of uh, essays from 2015 to now. And that means of the, the present regime time. Um, these questions have been raised to Sri Lanka. Uh, is, is there how much of influence uh, coming from the extra regional um, countries? And um, it is, there are six thematic areas which I have highlighted in the book. Uh, one is geopolitics, a political landscape, um, foreign relations, uh, peace building and reconciliation, uh, democracy and institution building, and um, foresight and cybersecurity. So I put them together. So these are the six areas. Now, I was planning to release this book on the 70th independence, uh, which is on the 4th of February, uh, but we failed because of the time factor as well as the, it was impossible. So, uh, uh, so but anyway, it, we are, I wanted to do it this year, but it's happening this year. So this year is the 70th independence of the country. And it is also a, a book which sort of nudged the policymakers that um, there are areas that uh, for 70 years being, an, you know, having independence, what are the areas that we failed as a nation? Sri Lanka, according to uh, President Sirisena, is having 25% of uh, poverty in the society, uh, 3,800 per capita. Um, the economy is not doing really well, actually. Um, it is going through, um, although we are migrated from a factor-driven economy to an efficiency-driven economy, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, there are basic factors um, that are in question. So I have highlighted uh, some of those serious issues that is going through in the society, uh, from kidney diseases, from uh, health issues, from uh, various uh, aspects, a uh, high uh, amount of um, corruption uh, which has sort of uh, crippled the entire nation. The last election was based on corruption. And Sirisena coming in was a promise made to the people and also Vikram Singh that the corruption will be curbed and we will bring the perpetrators to uh, the courts and all that. But it didn't happen. And that's the reason that um, the the huge loss you can see uh, in the last local elections and Rajapaksa becoming so popular back again. Where the, because the the public didn't see the difference between the present regime and the former regime. And I have given this perspective working in the government, as you can see, uh, it's a difficult task to have an independent observation uh, while saving my job. I was fired once uh, in the government service. So that, that happens uh, when you give certain observations uh, which kind of disturb the policy makers. And, um, but um, the person who fired me uh, was fired by uh, some time back. And so th these things are, uh, <laughs> because uh, they, they, even today, there is ministries appointed in the government. Um, there are uh, cabinet ministers appointed today. We had two prime ministers uh, for the last two months and um, two cabinet uh, cabinets been appointed. So you can see the um, political dynamics, uh, how um, instable the, the country has become. I'm very happy that the India did not get involved in this recent uh, uh, constitutional crisis because the uh, moment you are involved and you're taking a side and you, once you take a side, you, you back that person in the, you, I mean, even if you don't back the people's uh, uh, sort of um, idea that the people would have is that you are supporting that particular, particular political fraction. And I think your policymakers were very uh, careful in this time and did not support anyone. And which is the right thing that India did. Now, um, let me um, give you like the few areas that I've highlighted, uh, like the six areas. And I'll slowly sort of give you a few points on uh, what I have sort of written. Now, I mentioned uh, Lakshman Kadirgama, uh, the foreign minister, one of the greatest uh, foreign ministers we had. I refer to some of his work as well as um, his thoughts. He said that India and Sri Lanka relations is lost in the mist of time. 
which is uh, you know we we belong to a very uh, old ancient uh, civilization 2000 years old there are new uh, thoughts ideas coming in from uh, liberal school as well as various other uh, thoughts yesterday i was talking at idsa and i mentioned machiavelli and there was one scholar who said no, we we'll speak about cautily also she's correct and uh, we should actually refer to our own work uh, the crossroads is that I see highly polarized society in Sri Lanka. One is in the Western camp, the others in the Chinese. I would say the one belt, one road, or the Chinese. So the Eastern. And um, now this polarization was clear in the last few, um, few months uh, when the Rajapaksa came back to office and he was appointed. You had the first visit was from the Chinese, Prime uh, the Chinese uh, ambassador going to his residence. And then the US um, ambassador tweeting saying that there's no democracy and democracy should be restored. And um, so while the US ambassador was backing the Vikramasinghe, the, uh, the center-right party of Sri Lanka, uh, the Chinese uh, ambassador was backing the center-left party, the SLFP. Uh, the polarization um, I see also in the society uh, another sort of a crossroad that I see. Every time we keep uh, events at the think tank. Now I do it as a social experiment also for the last uh, several years. I I satisfy both two groups, and one group I see is a uh, highly nationalist. When I, for example, I, I I bring certain subjects that are, I mean, out of sometimes my scope, which I've been criticised, like the swords of Sri Lanka in the national security think tank. And then they're saying, are you, what are you doing? Is swords of Sri Lanka? And because President Putin gave a sword to the, the president, um, of, um, pre president of Sri Lanka, think, talking about national values, important of preserving. And um, when we discussed about the swords, it was a different group that came in, the Highland, and they were very happy. And there was another group who was in liberal camp who was saying, what is, what is he doing? But when I bring in the liberal, uh, highly liberal, for example, and Professor Razin Sali to the audience, and uh, they're so happy, the liberal group. And then obviously nationalists say, what, what do you bring a new liberalists, right? And trying to, you know, uh, bring in prescriptions, policy prescriptions from Singapore. And this sort of two divisions is, is clearly seen. And they use it at the election time. And uh, the populist parties, the nationalist parties, they use the... Uh, uh, the uh, and it is also uh, Sri Lanka has a bigger issue because we had a, a three decade of war, and um, uh, where I highlight in that chapter on reconciliation and war how important that is because we have gone through a three decade of suffering, two youth insurrections, and um, so much of lives been lost. Uh, so the, the how important is reconciliation process and how much weight uh, should the government give? And re-engaging with the diaspora community, uh, we have not looked at. I speak about uh, three important areas on the diaspora re-engagement to bring the uh, economic benefit to the country, to bring uh, also their thoughts, uh, ideas, reconnecting. Uh, for example, the migration patterns are different, 80s migration, 90s. And the younger generation uh, of the Sri Lankan diaspora, when I say diaspora, I mean the Sinhalese, the Tamils, everyone, and to bring them and uh, into the country. And that's very important. Um, these areas should be looked at. Uh, genuine reconciliation can happen. Uh, reconciliation, a lot of things have been done. Uh, during my uh, time at the past uh, Kadrigam Institute also, we did eight national reconciliation conferences. But the request was, um, now at that time we had a difficulty of bringing in um, ideas uh, from the, the LTTE the, or XLTTE because uh, they were not allowed to come in and to voice during the, the previous regime, like the GTF, for example. Father Emmanuel wanted to come and speak at my one of my, this thing, then the government said, no, you cannot bring Father Emmanuel. We don't reconcile with the LTTE. And um, so I, I had a problem during the previous time, but now the government has taken a position to engage with all of them, which is a good position. Now there, there are uh, factors like the recent killings of the, the, the two police officers, um, which I was mentioning this morning also to Ambassador, that um, 
Uh, now, there are experts uh, who would say, terrorist experts who would say that the LTT might reemerge and all that. Uh, there is a certain fear is being given to the society. Even India and Sri Lanka should be cautious. But I don't see uh, factors of LTT returning. There could be incidents like this, but the regrouping and you know fighting against the government, no, that is uh, completely out. That 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 would not happen. On um, on the uh, Rajiv also mentioned on the um, the uh, Tamil Nadu factor, which is a very important factor. I call it the Kaveri Delta effect uh, to to the nation. I look at it from the ancient past uh, because what we have is an influence coming from the Kaveri Delta, the uh, the Dravidian influence, which we all has. It has been, and we uh, there was intermarriage during King's time. There was, um, and we our last king was a Tamilian. And uh, so we should live with this. We should not uh, fight over it and we should accept it, like, just like the way our kings did. And um, maybe the colonial uh, time there is a uh, discussion during, I mean, certain scholars have pointed out, it was the colonial time that uh, split this uh, relationship and made it uh, gravated, this relationship. So between uh, them, but anyway, the uh, the factors uh, remain that we have to work very closely with them. I mentioned uh, um, also at a event in ICWA since uh, Basad is also here that um, I heard um, uh, the Salman Khurshid. Uh, he was uh, the minister at that time, and India voted uh, against uh, Sri Lanka, and I was there at that day in India, and uh, when he mentions that. Um, you know, he feels like Muhammad Ali being punched so hard. And he's uh, been from from the south, from the Tamil Nadu. And he's waiting for that opportunity to punch back. And um, and he said that the central government's decision and um, it should be made by the central government and the influence of the, there are so much of influence coming in from the regional government <coughs> or the Tamil Nadu. But unfortunately, that it, he was not, happy when he announced it that we voted against uh, Sri Lanka. I mentioned that um, on my book. Um, I think India-Sri Lanka relationship uh, should be much uh, wider. Uh, track two relationship should be much more. Even yesterday, um, during my visit to the National uh, Maritime Foundation, I was saying, uh, what are the joint publications we have done, papers we've done. So I've highlighted also in my foresight side, uh, foresight chapter that a lot is important that we do joint research on areas of maritime cooperation, um, on Indo-Pacific. Um, I've also argued on the free and open Indo-Pacific FOIPs and also the uh, how Sri Lankan policymakers see FOIPs and also the OBOR, whether it's a sort of a counter to FOIPs. And uh, so I kind of argue um, the dimensions on um, how we see it. And I refer to works of um, scholars in geopolitics, uh, starting from Mackinder to Spikeman to um, Cannon to um, uh, basically Strauss Hube, Ambassador. So many of the uh, work that I have referred. Um, I try to sort of draw the spheres of influence um, that is coming, the triple sphere of influence, I call it, the Chinese, the uh, India, as well as the United States, the strongest uh, influences coming towards foreign policy of Sri Lanka. On um, 13th Amendment, um, like uh, the Ambassador Patsati mentioned clearly that uh, I, I refer to the 13th Amendment and also say that uh, you know the, it was done so quickly and it was not uh, consulted from, uh, by our public, the general public. An amendment of such nature should be discussed with the general public and um, it should come into some sort of, because a lot of decisions that are taken by our policymakers are not discussed. Uh, for example, the 99-year lease, I have highlighted on the Chinese lease uh, agreement. Uh, again, President Sirisena, I have quoted in my book, that he mentions that um, it, be, it has to be discussed at the, at the parliament. And it is important that this sort of agreement should be discussed at the parliament. Of course, I think that was a very good uh, thought that he had. But when it comes for execution, it didn't happen. Uh, they signed on a Sunday. It was only discussed for five days. And it came on a Tuesday, and then um, when, the, when, as a think tank, when we give observations on these issues, obviously you need, you know, we need time to look at it. When we did a quick, quick paper, like in two days or three days, um, uh, it was too late actually. But our paper said that 
uh, the 99 year lease is definitely out and we, we need to negotiate for a better and we need time and also uh, we agreed with the president that it should be uh, taken up at the think tank level and also at the um, parliament. But these things are not done. Uh, I think the uh, quick decisions taken by policymakers um, will get us all in trouble. I have highlighted the uh, serious issues of uh, corruption uh, that is going on in the country. Uh, for example, the, um, the, the bond scam and also the previous issues uh, of the previous government, but both sides I have highlighted independently. I have also um, mentioned on the, the issues on the journalists uh, we had, uh, certain killings of, uh, for example, the Lasanta Vikramansunga, who was one of the greatest journalists we had on Sunday leader, the assassination uh, of, uh, and then uh, the press freedom index that Sri Lanka has drifted away, the corruption index we have drifted away. So these issues I have clearly uh, pointed out that we need to sort of overcome these uh, issues. So um, I think uh, overall uh, we are at a crossroad. We need to choose the uh, a better path, um, a more rules-based democratic order, rather than uh, you know opening our arms to um, you know quick uh, money and uh, loans and uh, you know getting trapped. And so it's a the better path will be much difficult to choose. Probably, I believe it's not only Sri Lanka. When I visited uh, different countries like Kazakhstan, for example, uh, I saw this. Uh, this was like a few months ago. I saw this happening even in the Central Asia. Uh, I have seen also in other parts uh, of the world also, and also discussed with scholars, Ecuador, they are building ports uh, in Ecuador, uh, in Latin America. And um, there are a lot of uh, development projects that are going on, but uh, are the governments making right choices, right decisions, are the decisions of national interest? Uh, those are my sort of observations. So I think, uh, with that, uh, I would like to discuss with you uh, if there's any questions on Sri Lanka. So I thank you so much again to Raji and also everybody. Thank you. Uh, um, I think we'll go into uh, questions and answers, which, uh, may, which you may have to uh, get, get into now. Uh, anyone? So Raji, I'll just come. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, and thank you, ORF, thank you, Asanang, to be here. It was a great pleasure uh, when I was at Sapru House to welcome you more than once, and you were always very thoughtful and energetic, and it was really wonderful to see that because of you, the average age of participants in this room has really gone down today, which is wonderful. Uh, I'll just make one uh, comment and maybe two interrelated questions. I want to share with you that um, uh, Kalinga International Foundation, led by Ambassador Lalit Mansingh, former Foreign Secretary, visited Sri Lanka recently and had detailed discussions with five major think tanks uh, and the government authorities and everybody else at a time when the political crisis was at its height. When they came back, it was a rich trove of perceptions and views prevailing uh, in Sri Lanka. And largely it came through that while in the past uh, Sri Lanka had enough reasons to blame India for good or bad reasons, for the current crisis, uh, you know, virtually nobody was pinning it down on India, uh, even though there were some references to India and raw, etc. in the beginning. So this was a happy uh, development. But it underlined the uh, point that you have made. Uh, we are so near and yet we do not know enough about each other. And therefore, I think uh, the need for uh, think tanks, foreign policy intellectuals, others to get to know Sri Lanka uh, is extremely high. And I think especially with the new uh, generation of scholars coming up. So I would strongly support and recommend that here. Uh, I have two uh, questions. One is, uh, you know, about this polarization that you have spoken in Sri Lanka, the US camp and the China camp. Um, so we know what the China camp says about BRI and 
stroke obor and china's role what is your own position on this uh, you have referred to the fact that you are very uncomfortable about the 99 year but overall is it true to say that uh, sri lanka does want china's money but it is uh, very very when it it comes to china's way to dominate the policy space and the strategic space and the naval space that ambassador parthasarthi referred to to you earlier in a very cryptic manner but very valid manner so that is my first question and the second could you just elaborate a bit more without uh, undermining the chances of the sale of your book uh, when you say uh, that Uh, Sri Lanka should choose a better uh, route, you know, a rule-based order, and avoid debts, etc. Just a little bit more to make it more interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, the the uh, idea that I tried to uh, figure, the the two parts, um, uh, you know, the roads, which is the the China as well as the U.S. um the what i'm trying to say the three spheres of uh, influences that our country is having we need to balance it and i refer to works of um, starting from madam bandara naikers sort of closed uh, indian ocean zone for peace uh, coming in uh, but then uh, javadana's opening up to united states to come in uh, during 1978 and the the two sort of um, you know the political ideologies that came in Uh, one is a close but not to allow extra regional powers to come into the vicinity then the other is to opening up and um, so the my so, so sort of suggestion is balancing would be the best possible way a small nation like sri lanka could do and uh, carefully calibrate on policy not to come on you know quick decisions like the 99 year lease uh, and many others um, projects that are sort of already in the pipeline and uh, sri lanka has to be extremely careful uh, when you're making decisions on even on the submarine visit i have mentioned um, the the i think it's important that uh, sri lanka and india has closer uh, collaboration in these areas because every time a chinese submarine comes to sri lanka we don't need to sort of you know uh, be alerted like this and the media plays another role when it comes to uh, uh, but when you inquire about the even the first visit submarine visit uh, f- from a few indian uh, scholars who were here as well as in uh, on also the officials it was made too political also by uh, the media community and all that but then uh, i think we should have better uh, understanding uh, like you mentioned that we don't have but when i raise these questions uh, from unfortunately from indian policy makers um, there is a there is a bit of a reluctance also to say that okay we will have some sort of security understanding on these areas and uh, these are areas that we should build because geographically this is the closest proximate country that you have and uh, we should have that a uh, muscle to sort of say that india sri lanka has this understanding and uh, submarines can come for port calls that is fine but we have this richer understanding a better a security understanding so balancing uh, is my sort of um, view that i bring in uh, united states eu is our largest exporter Uh, like for example the exports are uh, sent to eu and us but china is uh, we are getting the, the imports actually the largest importer and china has become the largest trading partner uh, in terms of imports not only exports so over, over, over coming overpassing uh, india and uh, so it was india used to be our largest um, trading partner now it's china so these dynamics are happening and balancing is extremely important and carefully uh, taking calibrated decisions Uh, rather than sort of you know knee jerk um, reactions from uh, policy makers on certain uh, projects on decisions you know and we get into a much uh, have actually opened up a huge risk we bring by uh, for example now there was a discussion on the the military airstrip uh, palali uh, that india uh, was interested and then there was a feasibility study should be done and then the prime minister was uh, speaking about it but you see now there is a there there is a strategic side we have to look at a military airstrip so the india is it the right time for india to come and invest in a military airstrip i don't think so 
So, uh, because <laughs> you come and uh, invest at this time to uh, Palali, that's on the northern uh, airstrip. So these things have to be looked at in strategic dimensions. I mean, uh, some may be looking at in the economic dimension, maybe creating another airport. But I don't think the strategic dimension has been considered in that decision by India. So these, these decisions have to be carefully thought. Thank you. Yes, sir. During the very bad time with the Sri Lankan face over there. And so I had three types of friends at Sri Lankan. One of them was Tamilians, pure Tamilians, the second, pure Sinhalese, and the third, Christian Tamilians. And during that time, it was a very traumatic time for them. Still, many of my friends, because in Canada, at that time, India was not considered to be a rich country. So we had very few, let me be very point blank, frank, that Indians as such had never had too many white friends. And Sri Lankans were their <coughs> best friends. And I still nurture that type of friendship. Let me make statements and then, then I'll ask three questions. That was the most traumatic period in the Sri Lankan history. The second period was of, there was a tiff going on between the three individuals. And what had basically happened, the LTT started speaking to the Tamilians that please don't speak to this. And there was a internal tiff because they wanted to have funding for the LTT movement. So I'll, I'll talk about it. And in, in reality, there was a very big rift between the Sinhalese people, the Tamilian people, and the Tamilian Christians over there. The third phase of Indo-Sri Lankan relationship is the IPKF war. And my, both my elder brothers participated in that war. One of them was a doctor. So he treated all the Indian soldiers and the Sri Lankans of the injuries. And most of the Indians who died had injury marks on the back. That's sick thing which my elder brother, who was the commandant of the army hospital in Chennai, my brother was flying helicopters, so he used to provide us. My question to you is that, has the pain of the 1983-82-83 trauma is over? Number first question. I, thanks to the ORF, I happened to meet your Madam Prime Minister, respected Prime Minister, ex-Prime Minister, and I heard her saying, that the pain of the IPKF is still in the Sri Lankan hearts. So has that thing gone down? And the third question is, why the Sri Lankans admire the Indian cricketers? Because my friend, Sarath Abayakun, who is the chancellor of a very important university over there, he's my classmate, whenever he comes, his first request to me, Rajiv, I want to see an IPL match, and I get him the best seat at the Kotla Stadium over there. So, <coughs> pleasure to meet you, and please answer my questions. Question: I think uh, I think, <laughs> think Parthasadi, um, Ambassador Parthasadi, would be the best to give more light because he was there, and um, I was a kid at that time, and uh, he actually saw everything. Um, but his own eyes, his experience, all of it. Um, on the 83, uh, with the, are we still feeling it, uh, the Tamilians? Uh, I think the uh, diaspora is still feeling it. I'm in touch with a few of the diaspora members. Um, um, as you know, my father was also assassinated by the LTT. 
um, so I'm in touch with them, I mean, the diaspora. The Canadian diaspora, especially, uh, there is uh, Rahim, who is there in Canada. He's number two, uh, he was number two in the LTT. He is in touch with me. He's, um, Kitu is basically, Kitu and Rahim ran the show when Prabhakaran was here. And Rahim is now in Canada. <laughs> okay. So um, I think the, their view is still there. I mean, obviously, because they're hurt. A lot of people have been killed, uh, assassinated. And um, uh, so I think um, reconciliation is the only way forward. We have to reconcile at some point. I have to, uh, on, even in, on my father's death, uh, I have reconciled with them. That's why I'm talking to them. Um, and you, there's no other way forward because you have to think of the future generations and um, there are mistakes done by the policy makers initially, 83 for example, burning of the library that was a huge mistake and policy makers were silent at that time uh, so I would support them in 83 because if that happened to me uh, putting myself in those shoes, I would be hurt. Uh, there were grave, grave mistakes uh, done by policymakers. Uh, so now the way forward is to reconcile. President Sirisena actually did a good thing one time in his administration. Uh, he forgave his own suicide bomber. That's a, I think that was a, it was not um, projected much in the media, but then he, I think that's a great thought. You know, somebody coming to assassinate and then he was clearly earmarked and he was arrested. And then when you forgive the suicide bomber, he comes and um, now he's having a normal life. But then he thanked the president. And uh, so the, the thought was, was it, was it done on a political reason for popularity? Uh, I don't think so. That, that sort of genuine reconciliation should come. And um, because what's the use of, uh, you know, referring back to the, the situation? And Prabhakaran was a, I mean, you look at him as his, as a leader. Did he actually was there for the Tamilian cause? So, I don't think so. There, there's been issues even at the IPKF time. The, the uh, his leadership you can question many times during the, even at the IPKF time. Um, probably he didn't sort of uh, stick to the words that he mentioned. He didn't want to come into political uh, process. He was looking at um, a separate land, and it was impossible to uh, give the Elam that he was. I mean, it was not geographically. Historically, you can't sort of, number one, approve it, that they had a separate land. And then he was fighting for it. So I think the political process, he completely, uh, killing of Neelan, I have mentioned him here, Neelan Tirichalan. Uh, and also, I quoted his wife, actually, after losing the husband, how a wife feels like. And I quoted her, uh, saying that he was not, not allowed to come home. He was a Harvard scholar, a humanitarian. Uh, I mean, he was one of the greatest minds of what we had, but assassinated. Um, LTT saw a lot of people like that as a threat. And uh, so they got rid of, just like that. And... Um, the, I think this reconciliation is the way forward. So uh, 83, yes, I would say outside the country it is there, but we need to work more towards that. Celebration of victory, um, I don't agree from the initial stage that when Sri Lanka every year celebrated the victory, I said, let, let, let's look at it in a reconciliation day, a day that to remember and also to reconcile rather than projecting uh, a victory. Uh, that would sort of, you know, divide further. So this was my observation. And the cricket, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't follow cricket. I'm one of them, so... Uh, <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much, and congratulations on the release of your book. Uh, my name's Susanna. I'm from the New Zealand Mission here in Delhi. Um, and thanks very much for your um, insightful comments thus far. Um, I'd just like to note on the matter of um, the dichotomy, um, the West and China or, or um, free and open Indo-Pacific and OBOR, um, that countries like New Zealand, we actually share a number of similarities to Sri Lanka. We have Australia as a very big um, country 
with natural connections. We're also an island nation and we also need to be expeditionary in order to build relations because, you know, as a small country, um, money and people are not necessarily coming to you. You need to go to the world. So um, uh, I'd just like to sort of note as a point of... Um, fact that countries such as New Zealand are sitting out there for Sri Lanka um, to have that dialogue with. We are all facing the same sorts of challenges. China is also a very big and important trading partner for us. And like you, I really encourage um, the investment in track two, um, restorative justice, as you say. Like you, we celebrate Waitangi Day rather than a sort of victory, black and white uh, situation. So... Um, Although there is the West, um, please know that there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, grey zone in the middle and we look forward to being part of that um, discussion with you. To New Zealand also, in the book uh, where I, it was a visit to New Zealand that I learned about your quota management system which you have on the amazing uh, the fishery stock how you manage it. I apply that to the Indo Indo Sri Lanka issue, the you know, the what we have, the um the fisher the fisherman issue that we have, whether uh, at I mean, not right now, or maybe in several years, maybe can we sort of move into a, such a sophisticated system as a QMS where quotas could be given to fishermen and they could come to our waters, we could go to their waters, sort of, you know, and uh, that's that's a beautiful, I mean I would say one of the most sophisticated systems. But our region should be very optimistic. We should go to this level. We are being even in the, even yesterday's IDSA conference. Um, there was a bit of a pessimism on regional collaboration because of our tension that we have as a re as a region. We should be much rich uh, than what we have because we have so much of poverty, all that internal issues. So regional collaboration, multilateralism. We should work on these areas. Um, no, on the, the you mentioned the. I, I think New Zealand as an island also is uh, feeling the same sort of uh, sense because of this free and open Indo-Pacific as well as the uh, One Belt One Road initiative that has been floated. The why I sort of trigger a question is to the policymakers whether how much influence is put for. I mean, uh, is been made by these two uh, scenarios towards the policymakers. Now you 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 must have read about the the New York Times article on the um, the you know political campaigning lobbying yeah, on the Chinese um, money that is coming in and then the, the New York Times article so lobbying and uh, these sort of things do happen and um, as you know Sri Lanka is not a, a rich country it is only got three thousand eight hundred per capita influences can be made to policymakers. And uh, this is very dangerous. And so this is because the, you will have uh, when you when you <laughs> the policymakers will not look into a strategic spectrum, but they will keep on sort of you know uh, becoming ambassadors of those uh, particular countries. And um, you know and you know uh, this is quite dangerous. And th this sort of thing could happen to small countries. And we should be cautious about it. We're taking independent decisions when it yeah. comes. To and just to note on that, I mean, 1984, New Zealand was technically insolvent. You know, we were pretty much broke in 1984. So, and it was through the strength of actually policy decisions that we then became a wealthier country. So, yeah. um, once again, the dichotomy doesn't need to be um, a bag of money or or mm. being broke. You know, policy can be very powerful too. Sure. But thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have a question? No, no, not me. One more question because we keep talking about fisheries and, uh, you know, Sri Lanka surrounded by the Indian Ocean. What are your thoughts on the possibilities of collaboration in the field of blue economy, uh, Sangha? The blue economy. Um, I I I actually emphasize the the richness of the Indian Ocean and how much that the India. I mean both the I mean Sri Lanka and India. We have not um, taken much advantage of what we have the ocean resource what we have, and um, unfortunately, um, you know we we are sort of um, in 
moving from the economic side, think, thinking of the economic side, we moved into sort of military and political dimension uh, much more. So there is more sort of a, the balance towards, uh, I think, sort of been lost um, in this because economic side is not being looked at because always sort of about a, a base in Djibouti uh, or, a poly, or a security tension that is coming in. But, the, we, but once we give focus to these areas, we lose the economic uh, sort of dimension. I mentioned uh, in a couple of articles about it, there are media highlights on the Nimitz. I start from the US uh, aircraft carrier, uh, the Nimitz coming in to Sri Lanka, how big that is. And, you know, uh, it's been played so much by the media that, you know, aircraft carrier. Okay. I call it a floating base. Uh, so, so I sort of my point of reference was like saying that this is also a base. I mean, it's, it's a floating base with 5,000 people. Um, the, I think the security dimension is spoken much, which which is uh, is important. But then again, the economic side is not looked at. The um, the resources we have, the what Sri Lanka is. Uh, I mean, we are claiming from uh, the, our sea, from the um, UN um, uh, the law of the sea. You know, the the twenty one times the uh, zone now, uh, the richness of uh, basically the uh, what we have, the minerals uh, as well as the. Um, the uh, the fisheries and various other uh, sort of dimensions are not been looked at, and um, uh, it's important that uh, we focus on because Indian Ocean will be the future uh, of us will be in the ocean. We will have to focus. I I refer Kaplan, um, uh, his work also on referring to Indian Ocean and the richness of Indian Ocean. The reason of the the extra regional influence is also because of this richness of our ocean. And uh, managing the ocean resources should be done. Um, I mean, India and Sri Lanka should have some sort of understanding on this. Uh, I know that code of conduct and this sort of things have been sort of orchestrated. But then uh, you need, um, uh, again, a consultation from all stakeholders when it comes. You know, the COC, if you look at the, even the COC document, which was uh, code of conduct, um, even in the Sri Colombo community, uh, you, it's not all think tanks have consulted on the COC. So, uh, so COC, uh, even the policymakers also. So we are also in a sort of uh, Indian perception on the COC yesterday, but which I heard was that it is, uh, it is coming from Sri Lanka. And then uh, it is something that I said, uh, no, it has not still been consulted by uh, many. And... Yeah. The idea comes from China. Yeah. Code of conduct because they are unable to produce the code of conduct in South China yeah. Sea. So this is their diplomatic ploy and we are quite happy to play along. No, even recent now, Prime Minister, for the Indian Ocean Conference, they were discussed about it. But then again, uh, on the President's side as well, as they said, well, can you see what this COC was going on about? Even in the uh, in Australia re recently, there was a discussion on the COC and all that. But then I don't think uh, all parties have been uh, sort of considered and uh, their views have been considered in this. Um, so... I think it's important to do that because um, the playing, uh, uh, how India sees it is, do we need a code of conduct, number one? Uh, that's that's the first question that uh, we should raise. But I don't know whether India uh, sort of uh, see your Indian view on that because, yeah. Okay, thank you. Should rethink about the India Sri Lanka FTA and its effectiveness. Thank you. The FTA, uh, which is um, again uh, in question uh, as well as been discussed by you know so many years now, and um, no, the uh, I think that again there should be some uh, discussion in Colombo. There is not much has been done on the even at the FTA. So now the benefits to Sri Lanka has to be understood uh, by our community. And uh, because, we, well, now for example, the Singapore FTA, I'll give you an example. Now Singapore FTA is going to be out because the uh, President's report, uh, the committee report says that uh, the, there's no 
benefit, not much of benefit is coming into the country, and sort of uh, it's uh, more benefit to uh, Singapore. And the experts have pointed this out. So, but then it can be ruled out by another set of experts also, by appointed by the prime minister in the Sri Lankan case. But what I think the benefits have to be clearly uh, explained and uh, understood by our society. Then the policymakers should be able to back it. The problem is you you try to do it in a you know fast as possible in a way. And this anyway, why should we do it in a quick manner or in the, uh, these things can take time, and uh, we could we could schedule a time frame, uh, you know, for it to happen, and uh, then we could implement it. I mean, the, even if you ask from the general public, now the Colombo view would be different from the outside village view. If you ask about the FTA, they might say as a huge fear, <laughs> or a villager would say because of uh, again uh, policymakers would uh, would make those you know for their own advantage probably on their political advantage, they would do that. But we should find a, a way to sort of implement these things. It's important. I, I support fully multilateralism in here. I think the way forward is multilateralism. You need to engage, um, bring more sort of um, uh, collaborative uh, approaches, economic dimension-wise. Dr. Ka Saman Kalagama, I have mentioned, um, he worked so hard to get the FTA uh, Unfortunately, we lost him also today <coughs> at the IPS. He was heading the IPS Institute. The, it's important that these things happen, and uh, we need to sort of uh, you know uh, work on it. But then again, the, we need to send the message across to the people, show that the benefits uh, that India, Sri Lanka would get, and also you know, vice versa. Thank you. Any other queries? Well, uh, let me. Can I just uh, one quick? Uh, yeah. uh, because of the point raised by Ambassador Bhatia and so uh, I think uh, China with its deep pockets, I think its very its presence in Sri Lanka is quite clear and uh, India has its own uh, lacunae in terms of the economic wherewithal to uh, do things where uh, what Sri Lanka needs um, and in that regard I think there has been the talk about and this has been part of the India-Japan for instance the joint statement about India-Japan going together uh, to aid assistance, um, uh, extend assistance to Sri Lanka where it needs. Is that something uh, that you see as a feasible, uh, is Sri Lanka open to that kind of a partnership, India-Japan partnership in Sri Lanka in extending aid and assistance to uh, some of the infrastructure projects and uh, other sectors? Is that a possibility? How do you look at that? Well, um, if you look at yeah, uh, Mali, yeah. for example, uh, which India and Japan both interested in it, uh, they, um, I think uh, even in the Trincomalee, uh, if you look at the early agreements on Trincomalee on the IOC, and those are yeah. there are questions uh, raised again because of uh, you know the again the lease agreements that were signed and um, at that time, um, but. Definitely, Japan and uh, India could uh, work on basically development projects in Sri Lanka and uh, how best we could balance. Now, the, the situation here is that uh, you should understand now, Hambantota, after the 99 years, then you had the Matala story, the airport, and then uh, it's also called the ghost airport. There's yeah. no flights coming in. <laughs> and... Um, now, India's interest in Matala and then to whether is that to sort of balance uh, China or the influence of uh, balancing. So there were many articles. So I captured sort of a gist of it in the book. And um, um, basically, what, what are we sort of, uh, are we sort of using uh, one part of the island to, for another uh, nation, another to the south to the China, then the west to somewhere, somewhere, somewhere else? Are we sort of balancing that? Or I think um, then I was also saying about a multi-base. I mean, if you're looking at even bases, you know, you think of a multi-base. And then, I mean, if, if the base is... Uh, now, there's one, one discussion that I want to sort of uh, mention, uh, a Japanese scholar who mentions um, that does Sri Lanka has the muscle to uh, sort of ward off um, if, there is, if there is a serious um, uh, interest uh, coming in from the Chinese, for example, on a base and all that, does the Sri Lanka have the muscle and the economic power? Maybe in the future, will Sri Lanka has that power to sort of ward off that uh, pressure? 
So the Japanese scholar was saying, no, you will not have the rate that what's going on in the country. You will, you will. I, I agree with the scholar because the economic situation is not so good. The political situation, the instability that is going on. Uh, if these things continue, would we have the muscle to sort of, you know, uh, ward off this pressure or limit this pressure? Now, that's the very rich question. Uh, I, I would say that uh, we would need to focus on that and um, have more uh, rich engagement with India. That is number one, because that's the closest, geographically that's the closest. We need to establish that. And we and think tank level, we could do that, Raji. And the Japan coming to develop and India coming, of course, that, that, that's a great, I mean, there is no uh, issues from the general public. Uh, like, you know, about even at the Hambantota on a predatory loan, if you ask the general public that, um, is that is this about a predatory loan or, you know, they wouldn't care if it's a predatory loan. I mean, it, it would be in the Colombo circles yeah. that uh, the, what they want is development for the country. As you know, it's a, it's a country that has been going through so much of suffering and all that. So uh, even the highway is appreciated by the general public. They appreciate the work. But... But when, it, when you have an airport without flights, there is a question there. Because the feasibility, well, the feasibility studies were done, the business models were done. Again, um, how fast these decisions were made. And, um, and it's a 100 million, I mean, it's a waste of money, I would say, because when you come into decisions like that. And when the airport was, when the proposal came in, so our writing basically at the Kadir government, I was there. And so I was, my suggestion was to expand the terminal, have another terminal in Katunayaka. Um, but, um, you know, that would have been a better option. But to have another international airport, uh, what could we cater? The, uh, the surroundings, the hotels, how many hotels do we have? Nothing was looked at. We have only one hotel at that time, now we have two which is Shangri-La and the Peacock, and so that, that's about it. But then does, does tourists come for this? How, how much could we sell? I mean, business models need to be looked at. If Trincomalee is a strategic port, um, it is not a commercial port. Trincomalee could not, because it's a 70-meter depth, uh, natural depth <laughs> it has. It is a strategic port. Uh, I, I, I look at it in a... Commercially, the, you can bring in, um, you know, cement and all these tankers in. But it is a strategic port, and um, it's very important um, port that we have. And um, so I think the development of the surrounding areas of Stringcombe should be uh, looked at. Um, I mean, thinking of the national interest also, and bringing in the development. And um, so development work, yes, of course, we be welcome. Um, but it has to be looked at um, in a way of interest, our own interest. And because we cannot have, for example, the another um, matala, and uh, because uh, if the biz if we give something like this, and if there's no benefits coming in to the country, and uh, obviously there is questions and uh, questions made um, raised by the public, general public, what is going on? Why do we spend so much? And um, if, even if you look at the the lotus tower, I don't know whether you heard the. the the tallest tower we're building uh, in, in there. And again, a Chinese loan was uh, taken, a revolving restaurant on the top. Uh, is that a priority uh, when an economy is going through like this and all that? I mean, a tower uh, with a revolving restaurant on the top. Um, then again, uh, an antenna on the top. I have mentioned that also, a Chinese uh, uh, installation of an antenna. But we, and they mentioned that it is a military installation. Uh, military um, antenna. And so then, there was questions raised. Um, then the the Chinese, uh, the um, the reply on the Chinese uh, att basically military attaches. So then nothing much to listen. Even if it's interception in India, there's nothing to listen. So this sort of, um, I mean, um, even the submarine, it was like that because they say they said that it was not even nuclear. Why do you so worry so much? Uh, but I think the, uh, we need to invest the two countries. On uh, It is a serious time that we are going through with the global Indo-Pacific uh, issues that's going on and all that. And so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a time that we need to invest. And we have not done that, unfortunately. I, I don't see, see that uh, we have done it. Thank you. On the code of conduct, uh, India has settled all its maritime frontiers. 
either bilaterally or trilaterally. In the, uh, and just for, to set the record straight, uh, we don't go around with codes of conduct. When we lost a case against Bangladesh on an island, we handed it over. Uh, we don't we don't argue with international tribunals, and we abide by international treaties we have signed. So I think before people pontificate on codes of conduct, they would be well advised to first observe the international convention, the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas. Uh, every industry, international conduct on maritime affairs flows from the UNCLOS. So I hope our neighbors will understand that. And in the case of Sri Lanka, I can assure you my father was chief secretary in Tamil Nadu. And when the Delhi, Delhi handed over Kachativu, oh boy, there were almost riots there. But we did it because internationally, we had an obligation to hand it over. So uh, uh, let us be extremely clear, even as I said with Pakistan, it's not the law of the seas which is at issue, it's where the land, where the land boundary meets the sea boundary, which has to be determined. So I think any attempt at codes of conduct, as I see it, is a Chinese ploy to weaken the UN Convention on the law of the seas. And I would hope Sri, Lankan bear, Sri Lanka bears that in mind. Uh, this is point number one. Uh, uh, point number two is, uh, it does worry us if our neighbors get into a debt trap. Uh, let me give you the case of Myanmar. China, they, they wanted the port of Chokfu to be built, which is next to the port of Sitwe that we have built. Sitwe is merely to connect our northeast to the Bay of Bengal and access. The port project of Chokfu was to cost around $1.3 billion. Uh, our Sitwe cost much less, incidentally. The um, uh, uh, fact of the matter is, the Chinese were steamrolling them with $8.3 million billion of investments. And Myanmar suddenly realized, and I, I can assure you, Hamban Tota is now diplomatic language across the world of a country's sovereignty being sold. The, and or given up because of getting into the wrong debt situation. And that set of projects was not just Hambantota. It was the airport, it was the sports stadium, it was several which came in around that area. So I talked to my Pakistani friends. They are now worried because the Americans say, we are not going to give you IMF loans with our money if you're going to reuse it to repay the Chinese. I think this is an international reality we'll have to recognize that the Belt and Road Project has this dimension. I mean, Mahathir is no fool to turn down $21 billion of investment. It, it was just not walking into a debt trap. Uh, I would urge friends in Sri Lanka to also study the readings of debt trap diplomacy. Because uh, honestly, uh, I'm not interested in a naval base in Sri Lanka. Uh, we're quite happy with what we've got on our shores. But, you know, we also do sometimes worry when an, agree, an understanding reached on the Colombo port suddenly becomes a subject of more study. Um, for what? Um, yes, uh, the and the fact of the matter is that Colombo's 90% of its traffic is not meant for Colombo, it's meant for Indian ports. It's largely a transit port to India. So uh, um, I think, as I said, we should show greater sensitivity towards uh, Sri Lanka. I think the way our fishermen behave is abominable. They're in violation of the uh, treaty of uh, the Kachatevu uh, Treaty and everything else. And um, what we are now doing is really implanting some wisdom on the fishermen of Tamil Nadu that it is the Sri Lankan Tamil you are hurting in Jaffna by doing what you're doing. And therefore, New Delhi, I can assure you, is working very, very hard to get them deep sea fishing so that they don't transgress into your soil, but it's linked in Tamil Nadu politics. 
But uh, finally, uh, I would like to say this to this audience here. We are deeply grateful to you for the memorial to Indian soldiers. Uh, every time an Indian visits Colombo, uh, we regard it. And please believe me, 1,000 Indian lives were shed because the Sri Lankan party was being separatist. Uh, that is the reality, whatever uh, went through at that point in time. Um, you are our friendliest neighbor, and, uh, and uh, I, I enjoy my, my family and I visits much more to Sri Lanka uh, than anywhere else. But perhaps uh, more, uh, uh, much apart from the daily politics, perhaps we should start talking of uh, regional tourism and Buddhist circuits. You will benefit, we will benefit, because, and I hope ORF carries out a study. Uh, I'd be willing to help you. I'd be willing to get you guys from Aspen who would do it. Because a Buddhist tourist, tourism circuit containing Sri Lanka, India, and Myanmar will be a money spinner which uh, all of us will benefit from. So thank you, uh, Raj, uh, Rajeshwari, for inviting me. And I'm sorry for boring you with a uh, Thank you, Ambassador. Longer. Absolutely. It's uh, great to have you to moderate this particular wonderful discussion. And much thanks to uh, Asanga for making it to ORF. And we were the first ones to yeah have this. And he got to see his book in India. First book, really, book discussion in India. First book discussion in ORF. We are very happy.